let me start with uh, Dr. Sanjay, who is an extremely well, Doctor, could you just say a few words about yourself and the organization you work for? No, no worries, Paul. Happy to do that. Uh, thank you again uh, for SCMA for organizing this. My name is uh, Sanjay. I'm from the uh, Global Center for Maritime Decarbonization. I'm the Chief Technology Officer there. Our main purpose is really to shape standards, um, deploy solutions, fund projects, and really create a collaborative uh, a network for stakeholders to really shift the needle on maritime decarbonization. Uh, I've been around the trap, so uh, this is my eighth job, primarily in the energy sector and most recently over the last five years with uh, the maritime sector. Thank you very much. And uh, perhaps Andre, if you would introduce yourself, please. Um, good afternoon. Uh, everyone, my name is Andrzej Jasianowski. I am a forensic naval architect uh, working here in Singapore in Southwest Quorum. Uh, and I specialize in uh, expert witness and investigations of uh, uh, all sorts of disputes, uh, accidents, uh, design defects and, and uh, uh, such like. Uh, the carbonization uh, has been at my uh, 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 heart for in my entire career since the beginning. Um, and uh, so I hope to have some uh, good discussions today about uh, uh, where we are. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Punit. Uh, thank you so much, Paul. And uh, thank you, SCMA, for inviting me. I have uh, been involved in the commercial shipping industry for more than 25 years. Um, my um, reason for being here or probably on this webinar is, is the fact that I've been involved with the digitalization and internal transformation of Claveness uh, during the initial stages and have been involved in digital transformation um, as a space for quite a few years since then. Um, and I am now taking over or starting off a new venture called VizBulk, which essentially is looking at a digital solution for bulk shipping, uh, whereby I think I'll test a lot of these um, ideas, which I will hopefully discuss and uh, learn from in this presentation. Thank you. Um, Helen, please. Last but certainly not least. Um, Sorry, uh, Andre. Uh, Andre uh, uh, Helen's stricken with COVID, um, so I've stepped in in her place. Um, my name's Andrew Steele. I'm a deputy director at North of England PI Club. I'm a part of the um, decarbonisation working group there. Um, my focus is predominantly on FD and D contractual disputes and the like. Um, but there's an increased focus on decarbonisation at the moment. Well, thank you all very much. Now, to the audience, let me say that I'm the dilettante here. Um, I know a little bit about everything and not much about anything. And um, when the SCMA kindly asked me uh, to moderate this panel, my, my first impression was, wow, digitalization and decarbonisation, that's an awful lot. Um, really, we could have a seminar on one or t'other, but the more, I, the more I started to look into this, I realized that, and I think Dr. Sanjay may actually disagree with me in one respect, but I realized that you cannot possibly have decarbonization and comply with the regulations for emissions control that are com coming in if you don't have digitalization, which to me means the independent, transparent and effective um, ability to collect information and data. And we'll go on to explain uh, why that must be so. Now, first of all, there's a lot of jargon, uh, as there always is in these things. And I know that in this audience, there'll be people who know a lot and there'll be people who perhaps don't. So for the benefit of those who are new to this or, or, or maybe not so involved as others, I just wanted to lay out a few basic ground rules. Now I've discussed, I've had the opportunity to work professionally um, both with Punit and, and Dr. Andre. I mean, Andre and I have been involved in some very substantial new building disputes, and he is an undoubted world expert in his field, as is Dr. Sanjay, and, and it's a real pleasure to have them both here. Now, I said to them that we would not afflict you with death by PowerPoint, um, but um, I couldn't really persuade Andre not to do that um, because <laughs> he will do that. So we've got a bit of a hybrid. Andre is going to afflict you by PowerPoint and he's going to go first because I think what he's got to say is really 
controversial and, and really will be very helpful. And uh, thereafter, um, I'll be going to the other uh, panelists and asking them uh, for their comments. But I want to share something with you now, very briefly, just to make a few, I think, basic points. And I wondered if you can tell me when you see my screen. I was able to um, get the loan of this slide from Andre. And I think we've got to have an overall view to start with. Um, this is from our World Data Organization. And you'll see that of all the 40 billion tons, they say 49.4 billion tons of carbon emissions, um, energy, accounts for the vast majority, 73.2%. Now of that, shipping accounts for 1.76%. And as Andre will show you, that's about a billion tons out of the 40 billion tons. Now, I'm not trying to say that this is of no consequence. Of course it's not, but it is very important to put that into perspective. I would also ask you to note that shipping is in my view, probably very narrow, narrowly defined. It's a bit of a bugbear of mine. I, I prefer to use the term maritime or, or marine, and you will see that that would include a lot more if maritime was properly identified. It would certainly come within resource development of offshore oil and gas fields, ports, terminals, um, all sorts of uh, maritime activities, which probably aren't captured there. But that said, I think that's a very interesting graph now, the next graph, which somebody like Andre will be explaining in more detail, shows where we've got to go to by 2050. You'll see that the two lines, the vertical and the horizontal lines, um, merge at zero, which is 2050. And the idea is that the carbon emissions uh, should be down there, uh, according to the COP26 and various other regulatory bodies, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, however, this chart shows that this could overshoot or undershoot, and that's the gray area. But again, I, 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 I say to you, that massive blue area, uh, shipping, in fact, um, accounts for um, a relatively small percentage of it. Now, you will be afflicted with a number of uh, abbreviations, and these are some of them. I'm not going to go through them all. Um, these, this slide presentation will be available to you. Um, and and um, I, I think it's, uh, you just have to grasp with these, with these matters. The ones that specifically affect shipping are CII, the Carbon Intensity Indicator, the EEXI and the SEEMP. This is a soup of regulations which apply to the shipping industry and to some others as well. Now, the starting point is, of course, the UN Climate uh, for Change Conference. Uh, the last one was last year in Glasgow, and it's called COP26. So there's been 26 of these. And what happened was that finally the world woke up and said, no, we can't keep saying we're going to do something. We've actually got to do something. And um, we have three decades. We have the, the 20s, the 30s, and the 40s until we get to 2050. We cannot be uh, reloaded. We have to get cracking from 2023 onwards. And unfortunately for certain sectors like the shipping sector, in order to be complicit with the regulations, a lot of new technology has still to come forward. So it's going to be very hard to try and make an impact, yet at the same time, be able to, um, yet at the same time, be able to uh, wait for the new technologies, particularly for shipping in, in, in different types of fuels. Now, the regulator for the shipping industry, as you all know, is the International Maritime Organization. Um, they're a regulator, but it's not really the force of law. What we cannot ignore in the shipping sector is the EU Fit for 55 regulations. These are even more stringent, as I'll explain later, um, on, on emissions controls. And they should become the force of law in 2023. Now, at least anybody who doesn't sit in the, UE, uh, the EU thinks that that doesn't affect them, it will, because unsurprisingly, ships go in and out of continents and a lot of ships go to the EU and they will be affected uh, uh, by its fines and regulations and, and such like. Now, I am now going to immediately 
uh, ask Andre to, to share with us his presentation, but just by way of background, if people are going to comply with the IMO and the EU regulations and other regulations, remember EU applies to all sectors, including uh, shipping, you need to have proper information and you need to know whether that information is correct. Otherwise, people will be innocently or purposely cheating on the correct quantity of their carbon emissions and, and, and the relief, both taxation, financial and legal, that they may get. Um, Andre, I think, is of the view that that's a very, very difficult task, and he's better to explain why. So thank you very much, and over to you, Andre. I'm just okay. going to stop sharing, sorry. There. All right. Does it work? Yes. Uh, yep. <laughs> or, if that's or, the slide you intended. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is to convey the mood of the presentation. Um, so uh, thank you, thank you, Paul. Um, again, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I uh, intend uh, to uh, share in this presentation some uh, of my general uh, observations on public data related to this evocative uh, subject of decarbonization, uh, but also I'll share some uh, past arbitration uh, cases that are related to it. Uh, so to show you uh, uh, first-hand uh, detailed uh, information. And my objective here is to provoke uh, a discussion uh, and a sober look at what this decarbonization actually uh, is about uh, today. And so um, very specifically, I will address um, or aim to show you the two um, conclusion of, of mine, um, which is that accounting for emissions is a black art, it's ambiguous, uncertain, uh, and that therefore all the regulations that are currently on the table uh, and that are uh, going to be applied uh, over a foreseeable future are more or less unfit for the purpose they purport to serve. So uh, let me go uh, into some details. So as Paul has observed, um, the carbon emissions from shipping or greenhouse gas emissions from shipping are small percentage. Uh, of the overall anthropogenic uh, emissions. But uh, notwithstanding this, um, there is the old saying that even a small grain of sand can tip the balance in the scale of war. And of course, we don't talk about uh, uh, one drop of oil or one drop of sand. We are talking about a billion tons of emissions. I typed here a number billion uh, because I think uh, we have to get accustomed what the number looks like. A billion tons of gas are pumped into the atmosphere every year. And that's only a small percentage of uh, them all. And so uh, IMO has set itself a, a strategy to reduce uh, a proportion of that billion, the international related shipping uh, by 40%. The international shipping will be something like two thirds of that billion. So effectively the 40% is really 30% of all the emissions by shipping, uh, but it has to be done by 2030. So within the next seven years. And then uh, they try to do it by 50% in 2050. Uh, what is important to understand is that uh, these goals are referred to as level of ambitions, level of ambitions, because they are basically just words and they are, as I will show you, quite unattainable. Uh, that's because CO2 historically have been only rising year after year. There is more CO2 being pumped up, notwithstanding all those efforts and regulations, and they are foreseen for any foreseeable future to still uh, keep going up. 
as you can see here on the right. So what I want to say is that rather than relate to those strategies as level of ambitions, we should simply call them what they are, a pipe dream. So, uh, but notwithstanding uh, that they are not effective, in my view, uh, there will be a headache uh, for legislation and for everybody involved, basically. And that's because we do have some uh, legally binding international regulations uh, that will have to be complied with. In particular, we have the EDI that has been in force already uh, since 2013, so very closely one year. And then we have a new regulations, ED, e e EXI, Energy Efficiency Design Index for Existing Ships. So basically it's a sister EDI, but for existing ships. The burden uh, for both of which uh, uh, squarely falls on the shoulders of the owners. Uh, but then we also have this new regulation uh, called a Carbon Intensity Indicator, CII, which under MARPOL's um, legally binding uh, provisions um, uh, through the instrument called SAMP, Ship Energy Efficiency Management Plan, uh, will have to be managed by not only owners, but also the operators. And therein lies the problem that is forthcoming because the two will have to work together to get it uh, done. So uh, obviously, uh, sorry, I forgot to mention that it is going to be in force from next year, 2023, but to have it in force from 23, uh, it has to be already put in place pretty much now. So we have plenty of online digitalizations tools, uh, class after class after different consultants offer pretty plots, uh, uh, colorful graphs uh, on your tablet, on your smartphone, on your computer, uh, uh, looking through the fleet, looking forward in the future, um, looking, looking all robust and, um, and, uh, and well. Uh, and uh, unfortunately to me, that is the main uh, policy of it because uh, those plots, in my view, basically give false sense of accomplishment and attainment um, uh, of doing something good, curbing the emissions, when in fact, uh, uh, they, they pretty much don't because of the data on which they rely. And let me say now uh, what I really want to say, uh, uh, the, what the problem is. So first of all, we actually don't know exactly uh, how much emissions there are. One billion, but really plus minus two, maybe 300 uh, million. Uh, that is roughly uh, uh, 15 to 20 percent or, or, or more sometimes uh, uncertainty uh, in estimates of the global emissions as conducted by people that do nothing else uh, for a living but do that, estimate those those uh, fuel oil consumptions and, and those emissions uh, for living. So the IMO, the ICCT, uh, the IEA, uh, they cannot agree. Now, 20% is roughly half of the emissions uh, that IMO uh, tries to address uh, from the international shipping. Uh, so it's uh, basically, you can almost say you can comply with it uh, without doing uh, anything or comply with half of it without doing anything, just by choosing the benchmark uh, for the measurements. But we could say that, uh, okay, this is difficult. These are international, whole world, global emissions. So maybe there is uncertainty uh, that uh, is inherent in that. And that actually, when you look at the ship, things are looking different. But as I will show you, uh, actually not. And I'll show you this based on the most sophisticated instrument right now in place to quantify emissions, EDI, which has been around for now almost a decade. So we are pretty experienced in that and which quantifies uh, emissions per dead weight ton per nautical miles. And it uses pretty scary looking formula. We don't have to worry about it because all these digitalizations will cover it up with fancy graphs. So we will never have to learn about it, but I want to show uh, and bring your attention to that uh, element there. Uh, this uh, is specific fuel oil consumption, and that is the actual connection between the plots that you will be seeing and the reality of how your engine in your ship 
performs. It is measured in a very controlled environment in a laboratory. So you see all these men in white, men or women in white um, uh, uh, shirts and, and doing this uh, very uh, precisely. So you would say that this is very precise emissions quantifications. The problem is that I have been involved in this kind of measurements for many years. And um, I can tell you for a fact that those measurements are uh, basically uh, totally unreflective of the reality of how engine performs. When we do go to sea trials, uh, which is again, quite um, uh, a controlled environment, you have all the tools to measure, control every input to measure the fuel consumptions um, and account for it, uh, for, for the environment and everything else to compare directly the shop test or the lab test with the seed trials. You can see that real uh, performance, real emissions is something uh, of the order of 10 to 20 percent uh, higher than shop test. And I want to stress that this is always higher. It is always higher. The shop tests are simply not reflecting the, uh, not reflecting the reality. Uh, so that's another twenty percent, uh, perhaps on top, or maybe explaining uh, the twenty percent that you have seen in the global uh, emission. Uh, if they are on top of it, then we have now forty percent uncertainty range already. But I can tell you that it actually gets worse than this. Uh, but my point is that even the most sophisticated method we have today in our hands is basically faulty. So, uh, but perhaps it is one of the reasons why this uh, new index have emerged uh, in that it tries to address the fact that it is not lab conditions where the ships operate. They are actually operating in the real environment. So CII have been introduced to measure the emissions per distance uh, sailed um, as the ship sails in real life. So it has to be averaged over one year, uh, documented and uh, reported. So it all looks pretty good on the face of it. We have target, uh, we have to reduce this emission intensity by 2023. So within the next coming months by 5%, uh, uh, by the end of 23, Another 2% on top of that by 24, another 2%, uh, 25, and so on. Uh, in 26, it's going to be reviewed and new targets are going to be set. Uh, so you can see that uh, it looks very precise, very accurate, and very neat. But let's look at the metric against, or, or the benchmark against which uh, these improvements are to be measured. So this is a datum taken out of uh, some presentation by our colleagues from class, and it shows the datum uh, in this blue navy dashed line, this thick line here, against which each ship of given tonnage, so let's say 100,000 tons, will have to measure again. So let's say five grams of CO2 per every ton of dead weight and every mile traveled will have to be uh, attained or, or reduced by 5% uh, by 23 and so on and so forth. Now, this is based on DCS, Data Collection System of IMO, the formal platform, uh, official platform, legal platform that will be used in the future to show compliance, uh, compliance with the law. Uh, in other words, this is the most sophisticated, again, datum uh, and, and source that is there to measure the emissions. And just looking at this plot, I want to show you this. If you look at those dots, the, the light blue dots, which are actual ship, you can see uh, that they show some minus 50 to plus 150% uh, 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 jumping around that datum against which you will need to show compliance. 150 percent. So for the same ship capacity, so you have two ships of the same capacity, you can have anywhere from two to maybe close to 14 or so grams, right, uh, of emissions uh, according to the best collection of the data. Now, this 
cannot possibly be real. Uh, and let's let's look at the possible sources. There, I, I can think of three uh, for now. One, it is the two ships or the, the two ships that are the same capacity are designed by different shipyards, uh, and they produce this staggering difference. The two ships are operating differently, and maybe one met some sea storm constantly, where the other one was sailing plainly uh, uh, through the through the year, or uh, perhaps um, there was some problem with the collection itself. So let's look at the three of them. Uh, technical, uh, we can look at how much the technical characteristics of ship, uh, ships can uh, perhaps uh, affect, um, affect the emissions. I think uh, it will be perhaps easy for you to understand and accept that uh, we don't have two ships of the same capacity that produced uh, that can produce 150 percent difference in emissions it just doesn't happen uh, we talk about um, uh, one percent difference two percent difference three percent difference all different things that you can throw at it uh, maybe add five percent saving here and there and that's what makes the price of the ship and and people go to certain builders because uh, of those promises of five or seven percent difference. Okay. Sorry, can you just go to your last concluding slides, please? I'm sorry, we're running a bit out of time, mainly for oh. due to me. All right. So this is to say, uh, operation, speed reduction, uh, and capacity. All of these are single digit or, or or maybe small digits of percentages. So so we cannot basically explain this, and therefore I'm saying that most likely uh, current system of collection of data is faulty. And here are my conclusions. So accurate accounting for emissions today is basically unattainable for both uh, setting the standard and then demonstrating the standard is, um, is met. So the IMO formulas are basically drowned in the margin of error. Uh, and as such, therefore are basically unfit for purpose for controlling and setting standard for the uh, emissions. Uh, but nevertheless, there will be headache uh, uh, with disputes, with legal challenges uh, for time and void charter parties, because how you measure, how you uh, show the compliance will affect your dead weight, your cargo, your speed, your routing, uh, your obligations of Atmos dis uh, due dispatch, and so and so on. And, and to put that in perspective, uh, what I want to say is that uh, 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 all those regulations are basically dancing around the problem. Uh, and we need a revolution, such as putting a levy of something like $100, $900 per ton of CO2 that would find, would make the solutions come. Uh, and I think that is uh, where the real for, uh, for, uh, challenge in the future comes, because this price will sooner or later fall on all of us and specifically on the ships in the future. Thank you very much. Sorry, Paul, for... No, not at all. You 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 did remarkably well, and uh, as I say, I, I forced you uh, in, into even less time. Now, look, I know a lot of you are wondering um, why we're not talking about the legal challenges and the key uh, the key legal challenges. We are coming on to that, but this background is incredibly helpful to engage in that discussion, which unfortunately is going to require um, perhaps not Andre, but uh, um, Andrea, myself, uh, Punit, and others. But I want to turn now to um, Dr. Sanjay, because really, I mean, by the way, uh, Andre, can I just say that's a highly controversial and really engaging presentation. And as I understand it, essentially what you're saying, without going back to your slides, uh, the bodies at the moment who are um, spending all their time monitoring actual figures for fuel consumption are way off the mark. It doesn't matter which one it is, ICCT, IE, or IMO. Um, that's not a criticism. There may be huge difficulties I'm unaware of. But as a result of that, when you come to plug in your formula, that horrible formula on, I think it was slide seven, the most important uh, feature of that, uh, of that slide was the specific fuel consumption. And of course, if that's out, everything else is out. And that's effectively what you're saying. And that situation is then compounded by the fact that even when on new buildings, even at shop tests, we know, and any of us who've been involved in shipbuilding propulsion or, or building um, new buildings will know that um, uh, shop tests are 
well, I'm not going to say rigged in favour of the shipyard but or the shipbuilder, but as you say, the actual is always much higher. Um, but we are in this transmission phase. I know you hold out great hope for nuclear. I know you hold out great hope for methanol, amongst others. We don't have time today to discuss all of the different fuel alternatives, which is very much a Dr. Sanjay's area. But we are going into a transition. And I think you do have some observations about some interventions, uh, Sanjay, um, which I'll now invite you to talk about. Um, and, and, you know, if you have any issues with what Andre said, please let us know. No, thanks for that, Paul. No, I, I think, uh, uh, Andre, thank you so much for that presentation because it does really reflect what's happening in the ground. Uh, and you know the numbers that you showed for the various interventions can be can be uh, disagreed in terms of whether it's on the lower end of the range and you know it's uh, on versus the upper end of the range. But in essence, the message is is quite consistent. There is a variance in the effectiveness of some of these interventions, and uh, there is a there's a need for to compound the various interventions on top of each other to get a, 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 a larger impact. But the, the, key, the key driver for decarbonization in the maritime sector is a zero or low carbon fuel. That's the one that's really gonna shift the needle. And Paul, I go back to the statement you said, well, I, I don't think you need to digi digitalize to change fuel. Shipping has changed fuels many times way before digitalization. Right, so if you can get access to low carbon fuel, you can decarbonize. However, you do need digitalization if you want to measure the impact when you are in transition, when you're not going from zero to hero, but you're actually doing drop in percentages, when you're trying to manage market based mechanisms, when you st start thinking of compliance to some of these uh, 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 regulations then digitalization becomes a key enabler of that process, right? And I think the, 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 main, the main lever is going to be new fuels, but the new fuels have very different characteristics compared to what we've been used to from a hydrocarbon perspective. You know, we are beginning to learn how to manage LNG from a quality and quantity perspective, but we, will, we haven't even started to understand methanol, ammonia, uh, biofuels of different sources. Uh, let's put away the palm, uh, palm oil sources. We're talking about new sources coming on stream, like algae oil. How, what kind of, whether the machinery today can do mass flow meters, uh, uh, estimations or uh, 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 accuracy of actually calculating the amount of drop-in that's gone in. The labs, are they prepared to do the, do they have the analysis, the methodologies to turn around the analysis within 24 hours so the ship can set sail. I mean, you can run ex uh, a long, uh, extensive testing, but it doesn't meet the operational needs. So there are going to be disputes. We already have disputes with normal fuel. We are going to have disputes on quality and quantity and carbon abatement, right? And for compliance going forward. Well, well Sanja, I know that you, thank you for that. And I know that um, you do have um, great hopes of one particular type of fuel, as you said, not not the wrecking ball of old old age um, uh, biofuels uh, and palm trees and wrecking forests and habitat, but, but as you mentioned, the new biofuels. Uh, could you say just a little bit more about that? And also, I think you once told me that there was one intervention. It wouldn't suit all ships, but it could suit quite a few, depending on routes and size. And that was rotors and wind. Can you right. say a few comments on those, please? Yes, uh, definitely uh, uh, on biofuels, we are already having discussion with generation four producers. That means producing biofuels from algae oil. Uh, there was a few announcements earlier, I guess a couple of months ago, I don't know whether you caught it on in new production plants in Malaysia, looking at uh, uh, and making algae oil available for the maritime industry. And this, this is going to uh, get more and more because we've spoken to another American-based group that is planning to open up uh, more plants around the world. So you're going to see this coming along. Uh, and once you do that, it, it kills this argument about biofuels competing with the food sector because they are actually growing it with seawater. They're not even using fresh water to grow it. 
So the, the environmental impact, they already have ISCC certification to show that they are actually very environmentally friendly. So we will see more opportunities and GCMD is working on a project and we make some announcements in the third quarter of this year uh, uh, about how we're going to actually allow, uh, facilitate the creation of an assurance framework for both quality, quantity, and also carbon abatement uh, potential of these new fuels. On, on wind power, uh, flatner rotos and sails, there's a lot of work going on. The challenge of these technologies, you need to pick the route that you're sailing. There's no point installing this technology if there's no wind in your route. You need to take advantage of the wind in your route. So we are talking to ship owners and the technology providers, and there's actually also a data resource which maps all the wind uh, routes around the world, and you actually can choose the ship that you want to kind of outfit this. And if you if if you can get the right route, you can save up to thirty percent in energy uh, fuel consumption. On the average, they're looking at between eight to nine percent on savings. But if you had a good day, you could get more. But these are the kind of technologies that we are beginning to evaluate and uh, the, the cost down challenges are still there. The, the return on investment is not there yet. But if fuel prices go as high as it is today, I think the ROIs will be easier to meet. Um, that's uh, very, very helpful, uh, Sanjay. I will be coming back to you on uh, accounting for um, sure. tax credits. And, um, I, I am fascinated by the wind because when we look at the interventions that uh, uh, that Andre listed, they were quite minimal. Whereas I think wind, as you say, could make up to something like thirty percent. Now, with that background, I just wanted to talk about very quickly um, the actual legislation on the legal side. Can you see my screen? Yes. Good. Um, so I'm now going to turn more to the legal side or what the, what the regulations actually are, and then I'm going to ask Punit and um, Punit more from uh, the person in the market trying to comply with these and, and, and how he's going to do that. And then Helen uh, to talk a bit about what sort of questions she's getting from her members on the ground. But we are in, in the shipping industry come under the IMO regulations. Um, and as already been said, uh, they, they want to reduce the carbon intensity index of the ships uh, by 2% annually to 2026. Um, and uh, the commitment date really is from 2023. And that, that was a commitment made at COP. Uh, ultimately, IMO wished to achieve a 40% reduction in the carbon intensity of the existing fleet by the end of this decade. So in the first decade, we've got to get down to 40%. So if you assume Andre's figure of 1 billion, sorry, it's not his figure, it's the statistics. Um, Andre says it's probably 1.3, but let's stick with 40% uh, now. That means we've got to be down to uh, 600 million and probably the fleet is going to grow bigger by then. One of the factors of emission is it's not just how many ships, it's actually the growth of international trade. And international trade seems to grow inexorably every year and, and more trade then depending on the type of commodity, you're probably gonna have more ships. So into this, you've got to look at not only reducing by 40%, that's with the existing tonnage. What happens if that tonnage goes up as I suspect it will do? We've already said that because of IMO's commitment uh, to, and, and the shipping industry's commitment to go along with it, we therefore have a whole soup of regulations and, and ship owners now, have to be complying with them. Can, can I please say it's not just ship owners, it's also ports, terminals, and everything else. Uh, and, and there are many, many ways to do this. I, I was speaking to Bing T, who, who was telling me that, you know, ports and, and, and shipping is looking very, very seriously at, at, at trying to, to reduce the amount of time that ships actually spend in ports um, so that they reduce the emissions, the sort of just in time enhanced route planning. Um, of course, that's going to give rise to disputes because I'm sure ship owners will be saying, well, if you want me to use this software, what happens if something goes wrong? And as um, Andrea and I were discussing, uh, we can see some great parallels there with weather routing 
and also uh, in the cyber area where the same types of concerns arise. Um, IMO has threatened, or rather not threatened, um, uh, has suggested that it may even go higher and adopt the EU packages. Now, looking at the EU, the EU Fit for 55, um, this applies, as I said, to all sectors, and it mandates shipping companies to buy allowances for their carbon emissions. Um, it also um, has got in place regulations for alternative fuel infrastructure uh, to increase shoreside electricity and LNG in, uh, input, input points. There's also regulations dealing with energy taxation directive to end tax exemptions for traditional um, marine fuels, whilst incentivizing the use of alternative fuels. And I should mention at this point that IMO has actually worked together with some organizations to have a, a fund of over 5 billion uh, to help developing countries in the shipping industry, uh, the shipping industry in developing areas uh, to try and comply with some of these regulations. So, you know, it's not just saying you've got to do this, they're, they're also um, trying to, to assist. And I think the thing about the EU uh, Fit for 55 is that it's what we call a well to wake, cradle to grave approach. Uh, and they look at the whole of the life cycle and the footprint, and they apply not just to CO2, but to methane and nitrous oxide. So, the new fuels, some of, it, some of which are, are emitting, of course, methane and, and nitrous oxide or could, they're also uh, going to have to be there. Um, from 2003, companies will be required to have allowances for 20% of shipping emissions, uh, gr gradually giving rise to 100%. So my last really comment on this is, what is the impact of all this? Well, the impact is that... Um, There'll be these um, ETS caps and trades, um, and um, uh, hopefully there'll be acceptable carbon levels, and total emissions have to come within this cap. Shipping companies, certainly in the first decade, in the 2020s, until the technology is there for zero, are going to have to buy and trade allowances for each metric tonne of CO2 admitted from ships of 5,000 GT or more. Um, operating between and at berths in EU, EU ports. So if a ship is entering or leaving the EU as part of a voyage, the company will have to cover 50% of the CO2 emissions. So that's where it has a worldwide effect. Companies will be fined 100 euros per metric tonne of CO2, not accounted for by an allowance, and will be required to surrender allowances equal to their excess emissions the following calendar year. Ships may even be denied entry to EU ports for continued failure to surrender the required allowances. So this, this has teeth and we're all a bit um, unused to it. I would say this, it's not yet law, but it's expected to be law in 2022 sometime, uh, which is remarkably quick when you consider that uh, COP was only last year. Um, I'm going to leave the, the background of the law at that point. I just wanted to make one final point. Um, I think, Andre, you told me, and I'll invite you quickly to respond on this point. You told me that the figures for fuel oil consumption were actually uh, only figures for international and not domestic tonnage. Um, is that correct? You're on mute, Andre. Sorry, my figures uh, were showing all the shipping, domestic and international, but I was saying that of that one billion, the IMO only targets the international shipping, which I understand is about uh, two thirds of all, all the shipping emissions. So that, that, that seems to me to be quite, a, quite an amazing omission. I can understand why it doesn't include it because it must be very difficult to get that data from small fishing uh, industry and, and whatnot, but even so it's an amazingly large omission. So um, we need to get the data. The ship owners need to understand the data. They need to know what the carbon emissions per tonne are. They need to know how to get their carbon credits. Um, respecting everything that's been said about digitalization, um, it occurs to me that it has to be transparent, it has to be digital, and it, it has to be independent. Um, now, Punit, <laughs> thank you for your patience. Um, 
you have a marvelous background apart from your um, great involvement with with the uh, SCMA uh, you're a man of huge enthusiasm and passion um, you have gone into so many areas of, of the maritime industry uh, which make you really uh, the most appropriate person to ask how are you going to face the challenge of digitalization and before you said it, it's not the same as digitized digitization the other one you can tell people <laughs> what that means um, but you are about to embark with your new company on you know top end logistical analysis and, and products so you too will be looking at your carbon footprint can you tell me how what how you see the role of digitalization in that absolutely thank you paul and and first of all thanks uh, dr andre for a very very interesting presentation i tend to agree with a lot of the points that you made um, in terms of the commercial viability of these benchmarks and regulations. And also I agree to uh, Dr. Sanjay's point about digitalization being very crucial on the transition of the decarbonization process. But once the low carbon or zero carbon fuels are actual reality and can be bunkered on a commercial scale, then digitalization is no longer going to be necessary because measurement is no longer a challenge or it's not really a requirement because everybody is zero carbon or low carbon. So I think the digitalization is a very crucial part, but there comes the challenge. I'll just try to clarify these three uh, terms which need to be understood in totality. Digitization is basically just a creation of a digital representation of physical objects or attributes. So whatever you have physically got in terms of a manual, process or a manual object, you're just trying to create a digital version of that. That's all the digitization does. When it comes to digitalization, you are then using those digitized products or processes to improve and leverage the data generated and try and create processes which are digital in the organization. That Even that is something which is manageable if something goes wrong and you have an ability to go back to the old structure or have some backup. The last part is what is actually happening in industry in a big way now, which is called digital transformation, which means that the digitalization is driving a non-changeable transformation of the industry, which means that you cannot revert back. It's a bit like milk becoming yogurt. You cannot take it back to the milk if you want to do it also. It's a bit like that. It's a simple example, but that's exactly how dramatic it is. So if something does go wrong with a pr process which is not yet tested by people or companies, which they are relying on for either carbon emission measurement or they're relying on for algorithms for their routing of the ships or whatever you have call it, you are then basically having a challenge where there is a chain reaction of mistakes or errors which can catastrophically create results for all the stakeholders in the chain. That is where the legal challenges really lie. How can you make sure that these digital processes and digitalization and digital transformation of companies is actually robust enough to withstand any legal challenges and failures which are bound to happen? This is where as an operator, as an owner, or today even as a solutions provider in Viz, I would be trying to basically make sure that we have as robust uh, a, a kind of a setup as possible when it comes to digital transformation. But that would be very interesting to hear from Andrea and even Paul, because I know that in the previous discussions, Paul has mentioned that cybersecurity has been one of the, let's say, trial blazing areas where there is a lot of developments which have happened where cybersecurity insurance is in place. You can get insurance for cybersecurity challenges and can we then also get into a realm of digital transformation challenges, algorithm failures, or anything else that can go wrong down the chain. This is going to be a crucial test for us because COVID has essentially created a fertile ground for, let's say, half-tested or three-quarter tested products to become real products out there. Zoom was a classic example. When Zoom initially was launched full-time, the beta version became a full played version. A lot of security concerns were there. You know, we have had Zoom calls in the early times when other people have bombasted in the meeting and just uh, barged into a meeting uninvited. And those kind of security lapses have slowly been fettered out. But those challenges can actually create a lot of catastrophic events. So 
as an owner as an operator a commercial person i would be really looking to get guidance from lawyers pni clubs and others to really see how do i manage those legal challenges as and when they arise also i would need some experts to help me in that regard uh, if i do run a challenge like that coming to the other part and i'll just be quick about it decarbonization uh dr andre mentioned it very very clearly that the cii or the carbon intensity indicator is very much an owner operator challenge which means that the owner has given a ship on time charter to an operator the trading pattern of the past year will determine the cii for the next year which basically means that if an operator has intensifying the use of the ship on long haul voyages etc cetera, etc cetera, it can very easily affect the next charter that the owner tries to fix because he may not be cii compliant and what does he do then does he have to wait for 6 months uh, to get the cii compliance uh, the grade that is needed in order to basically fix the next charter these are going to be very crucial discussions at some point of time who shares the blame uh the only way the owner can ensure that is to restrict the trade and and uh, cargo trading exclusions that is going to create a, a fight about what is the trading pattern which is allowed how can you police that pattern um all these questions are potentially going to create fertile ground for legal challenges uh notwithstanding the measurement of emissions and controls that's going to be a totally different discussion but commercially this is looking like a time bomb which is ticking away very fast for us yeah well, that's perfect. you've made so many excellent points and and really helped me enormously as the moderator to have to slip into engaging with andrea but before i do that um andrea you are on mute by the way if you could i'm soon going to ask you to uh, contribute so if you could come off mute um i do want to say that i do remain an optimist um we haven't talked about it now but i mean uh, sanjay has has been talking to us about you know the, the possibility of ships actually uh, sequestering their own um co2 liquefying it it going into a port and these big ports being collated put on a specialized co2 carrier sent down to some oil field probably in australia or wherever and then being recaptured as a way of of, of actually assessing uh your proper carbon um car a co2 vessels now are about 2000 tons but you know the koreans and dnv design are building these things up to uh 40000 tons so if that's going to happen and i sincerely hope it does if that's going to happen then the ships are going to have to have equipment on board all ships to be able to entrap their co2 to 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 liquefy it and and to to send it out i think i think co2 is at about minus 85 degrees somewhere like that so it's not it's not like hydrogen you know um so that's interesting but i can see all sorts of legal requirements there but i i remain an optimist because with right ship with with re- weather routing uh with uh numerous i mean the lng uh industry whereas i uh, there, there are invariably kpis a new vessel the, the charter and the owner will will agree that those KPIs are not guaranteed until they've seen a year of performance so they can then uh um analyze them and set them again but this is all in the context of long term time charters and i think the law is is very settled that has been very um flexible uh, and indeed uh the EA, eexi transition clause for time charter parties has been drafted by a body of people in the industry from from big players like Rio Tinto, PNI clubs, various lawyers um and, and that's ideal and it's a classic way of allocation of risk and what happens if a ship has to come off hire in order to be able to install uh, machinery equipment uh, which is going to help its CII rating um and I, i do remind people that that the charterers have a big interest in this some of these charterers are huge organizations the people that put stuff on board ships Uh, are more important than anybody else there wouldn't be shipping industry if there weren't people buying and selling cargo and they have reputational issues they have investors um they they have um uh, financiers and insurers who require them to be um carbon emission uh, sustainable 
And I don't think it's right to just turn around and say they're going to scrabble around for the cheapest option. Not at all. Reputation is incredibly important. We've seen Lloyd's uh, and other underwriters uh, refusing to, to underwrite new uh, greenfield sites for, for um, carbon products. So, you know, everybody's in this. What I will say is that um, I think that the, the law is very flexible, drafting, indemnities, allocation of risk is great, but the insurance has to be there. You talked about cyber, um, cyber is getting going now, but you know, it's been for a long time. Uh, I was listening to a very good uh, webinar on cyber, some great experts who are saying that, you know, insurance is, is, is getting around now to offering the sort of cover that people want, but it's taken a long time. We don't have that time here. We have to have the cover. And the thing that I'm sure owners are concerned with is if I have to put a piece of kit on board my ship in order to calculate my emissions or in order to comply with the charterer's requirements, what happens if something goes wrong? And probably another one, which would be, I don't like having to give all this pesky information <laughs> I don't want people actually knowing what my proper fuel and consumption is or my speed. Uh, maybe I'm being a bit cynical, but um, it's, it's a brave new world. So with that very long um, little sort of rant, I wanted to say to you, um, Andrea, you know, what challenges have your members been facing? What, what have they been saying to you? Um, there are a number of challenges, um, and it's, but they're challenges that are going to have to be dealt with. Um, in some way or another. Decarbonisation is a topic, is a very hot topic, but it's not, not going to go away anytime soon, if ever. And um, during the coming years and decades, there's going to be ever increasing legislation, I think, um, with ever tightening um, requirements. So unfortunately, people are going to have to live with it and they're have to, going to have to come up with means and ways of meeting those regulatory requirements. Now, there are a number of ways that perhaps those that can be done. And as a club, one of the things that we've been doing is a advising members as to what the reg current regulatory requirements are. They're very keen to know. And there's still a little uncertainty as to what it actually means. I think the EU ETS is a prime example of that. There's a lot of talk about it. There are drafts out there but it's not yet in force. The initial proposals that came in provided for a phased in um, giving up of allowances with a view to 100% of allowances being um, submitted by 2026. That's been reduced um, in the most recent amendments to 2025. So we'll have to wait and see. One of the things that members are quite interested in on the EU ETS is how it applies in particular for voyages that involve port calls outside the EU, whether it's the last port call coming into the EU or the voyage leaving the EU. How many ports away do those regulations kick in? Because there's a lot of uncertainty about that. So we've been giving guidance on that as to that it's the last port prior to entry or the first port after exit. So that sort of thing. Um, there has been on the EU ETS, um, a lot of attention given to the definition of the shipping owner. Now, the initial proposals, in practice, it was the DOC holder for the ISM who was defined as the shipping owner. The most recent amendments included the time charterer within the range of potential parties who could be the shipping company for the purpose of compliance with the EU ETS. In many ways, however, I think that's been a bit of a red herring because it's one of the potential companies, but how often realistically is a time charterer the DOC holder for a vessel? Probably rarely, if indeed ever. So I think got a lot of press attention, but I'm not sure really what difference it has made. However... Can I just say at that point, I mean, that rather harks back, sorry for interrupting, but it rather harks back to the OPL when the United States brought in its own pollution legislation and defined the carrier in very wide terms to include financiers and banks and everybody. So, 
immediately that raises the point, do these people actually have insurance for that? Is there a market for insurance? So if the net was cast wider than what we regard as the owner, and let's be honest, in the line of trade, um, charters are often owners. Um, in mm, yeah. Normal extent, you know, bare boat charters, anyway. Um, that does raise the question, if the net's going to be, the potential um, deep pocket is going to be spread wider, the insurance has got to be there. Yeah, and depending on the form of liability, P&I insurance may well kick in. There has to be a liability to a third party. Now, if it's in terms of pollution fines, then that would ordinarily fall within the scope of P&I cover. Um, but you have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. What, what is the liability that has been incurred? How did it occur? Why did it occur? But, but in principle, in general terms, pollution fines, and I think fines arising out of the failure to, make, to comply with decarbonisation regulations would, in principle, fall within that. I mean, one of the other things that as a club we've been doing, and, and, and to be fair, I think most clubs have been doing, is giving advice to members as to the various methods in which they can comply with the ever-increasing regulations. And I think some of the presenters here today have talked about some of those um, in terms of biofuels, alternatives, what modifications could be made to vessels, um, and what operational efficiencies can be made. But I think as an FD&D lawyer, the main points that I've come across are what are the contractual considerations that an owner and indeed a charterer should have against the decarbonisation regulatory background. Now, under a normal China charter, the time and cost of compliance with the decarbonisation rules will lie with the owner. Um, however, we're in a completely new era now. There will need to be new clauses developed in order to cater for that decarbonisation regulation. And I think Benco has started that. They've published the um, EEXI clause very recently. There are two other clauses um, in the course of being drafted, the CII clause and the EU ETS clause. As I understand it, both clauses are being presented to the Bimco Documentary Committee in the forthcoming May meeting with the view to hopefully adopting the same. Um, if you get these clauses in the, in the public domain, they will be picked up by owners and charters for inclusion in the charters because it's an industry standard. I mean, at the moment, there's been lots of attempts to tailor bespoke clauses um, which are drafted very much with an owner's hat on or a charterer's hat on, depending on who you're advising. If you have a single BIMCO clause, it's more likely to have wider acceptance. And it will have to balance the competing interests of both owners and charterers. This is, it's not a, a case where only one party will have to bear the burden. The practical reality is there's going to have to be a spreading of the risk. And people on their contractual basis, the parties are going to have to try and work together and produce something which they can both live with. Um, I mean, you said, Paul, um, reputation is very important to charterers. A charterer doesn't want to be seen as a party who's requiring an owner to perform voyages in a way that will cause them to miss their CII requirements. That, you know, that there will be market pressure, which will, I think, bring charters to the table to make them co cooperate and realize that they're gonna to have to cooperate here. I think as, as an owner, however, an owner has to realize that he's gonna to have to relook at things like his performance warranties. A lot of the measures that will be put in place, perhaps shaft or engine power limitation, will inevitably cause a reduction in the vessel's speed and performance. Just on that, if I could pick up here and ask Andre to perhaps join this particular discussion on speed. 
Um, Andre, uh, you're explaining that one of the immediate ways to, uh, you know, perhaps before the technology of alternative fuels gets there, to make a real impact is to reduce the speed of a vessel. Now, we have had, uh, particularly on long term time charters, uh, a lot of experience of what happens when a vessel is asked to proceed at economical speed, she does so, and then suddenly the charterer wants her to perform at full speed, and she can't, or full operational speed, she can't because he, she needs to have her uh, fuel injectors and um, flushed out and, and maybe carbon taken away and uh, pistons and all sorts of things. You can't just flick your hand and do it. There's, there's a, it she'll need to have some work done on before she does that. And uh, um, there are some very good clauses that were developed during that period where, you know, risk allocation was sorted out. In the same way, um, you were telling me, I think, um, that 90% of vessels, well, all vessels, tend to proceed at about 90% of their MCR. And that if you were to reduce, and say that MCR was 14 knots, if you were to reduce that to 70, you'd still be at about 11 knots. But the impact on carbon emission savings would be enormous. Um, I, I probably completely bastardized that would you try and ex explain it? But what, what I'm saying is that whatever the reality is, the lawyers and the p &I clubs can certainly draft clauses whereby there'll be a fair allocation of, of the risk there and to ensure that the owner is not then suddenly told to go back to full speed without having the opportunity to do whatever is required and those costs are shared in an agreed advanced manner. Yes, Paul, uh, you actually, you actually said it um, somewhere, somewhere between there. The speed reduction is a viable way to reduce the emissions uh, for real. Uh, for 20% reduction in speed, uh, so let's say from 14 knots to maybe 11 knots, you get 30% reduction in CO2 in real terms. So you proceed slower, you deliver your cargo, uh, and accounting for the fact that you have to uh, spend more time carrying the cargo to earn your money, uh, you have that 30% reduction in, uh, in CO2. Uh, of course, you can reduce the speed further. If you go down to something like eight knots from typical, say, 13, 12 knots uh, for bulk carrier, uh, you can maybe reduce it by 60% or, or, or 70%. So there is a viable way to do that. But uh, Nobody is going to do this if the charter is asking that, look, my contract says there is the dispatch obligation. You have to go as soon as possible. You have so many voyages per per year. Uh, and and so then you cannot actually do that and you will not do that. Well, do you, you does anybody know. here, thank you, Andre, does anybody here see, just making, talking about the bulk trade, does anyone here see any scope for the Baltic index putting out rates or indices for sustainable rates? rather than the normal rates that they're putting out. You know, instead of doing um, Brazil to North China, iron ore, Baltic index, whatever it is, would they have one that's a slightly cheaper freight rate, but it, the vessel goes at a slow speed? I, I don't know. It, is that possible, Pune? I think they have, they have got some uh, adjusted benchmarks on, on some of the commercial routes like uh, not Baltic, but SNP Platts, for example, have a scrubber, non-scrubber uh, freight number. So you can actually compare um, scrubber versus non-scrubber as such when it came to the VLSFO. Sustainability, I don't think is such done, but, but interestingly that you mentioned that Baltic recently did recruit a specialist to look at sustainability specifically. In fact, the ex-CEO of Rideship, uh, Martin Crawford Bunch. So I would say they are looking at sustainability as a way of getting their members to kind of comply as best as they can. And obviously Baltic should be able to help them, but whether they can set a benchmark, which is acceptable to everybody in conjunction with the IMO targets, I, I very much um, uh, doubt that that's actually- Well, it's uh, in interesting that you, you mentioned rightship because of course that is again, history that can come into play here. Um, <laughs> Uh, and of course, the you know owners are incentivized to be right ship compliant. But again, it's only in the bulk industry, and it's only for certain commodities and only for certain players. 
I, um, I think I think the thing with the bulk industry, why it needs something like that is because it's a lot more fragmented. Uh, with the tanker industry, it's uh, dominated by major players like the oil majors who have set requirements which other people are following. When it comes to container lines, they are a lot more uh, cohesive, a uh, smaller group of main line uh, operators, and therefore they have an ability to take an action and others can follow. In the bulk industry, it's not like a Cape size owner takes up a, a crusade and, or, 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 or initiative and everybody else follows along with that. I mean, Clavness, uh, with running the largest pool on the Panamax, it still has less than 2% of the, of the tonnage uh, to work with. So in, in some ways, the fragmentation of it will mean that an outsider like the Baltic or others need to play a greater role in the bulk space than containers and tankers, for sure. Yeah. Okay. What we might find as well is that the vessel CII rating might be used as a market measure. So the higher, nearer to A the rating is, the better rate an owner's, owners would be able to get. And the lower rating, there's going to be a, a lower rate of higher or freight payable. So I, I think so, it may not be as an official index, but it's going to be an issue that your char a charter is going to look at. What is the CII rating for this vessel when he decides to fit? And an owner is going to want to... You know, if he's got an A rating or a B rating, he's going to want a charter to know about that and try and get a higher rate of freight or higher himself. So it, it, that might become self-governing in that way. Absolutely. I, I don't deny that at all for a minute, Andrea. The challenge there is, of course, is that the entire CII is calculated based on the DMS yeah. system, which the IMO is working on. And uh, correct me, Dr. Andrea, if I'm wrong, that it's basically depending on what the vessel is reporting itself, right? So how do you kind of cross-verify that data as well? Um, I actually expect a two-tier market to develop for sure. Um, there will be top-level players who are compliant and would, would demand uh, to fix with top-level players. And, and there would be a, a second-tier market. Uh, but the challenge with the fragmentation, again, is that the, uh, the market remains opaque. So that's where digitalization might help in creating more transparency. So they are both connected. And I hope that they actually further the goal of transparency, uh, which is a big part of the discussion. Yeah? But I think what is clear uh, is that um, there must be market uh, uh, market rooted solution. If we can trade CO2 or a version of uh, the emissions on the market, then it will self uh, police. It will self impose the targets that are better than what I'm or others. Uh, target. Uh, so, so hopefully the um, uh, the ETS, the the European Trading uh, Carbon Trading, or some other uh, measures will come to fruition. And then, of course, comes the point: how do we measure that? So, what what Punit is saying about digitalization becomes critical because how do you make sure that what you are selling as carbon offsets or or, or car carbon aversion uh, is actually has actually happened. So you need to have tools to to measure that. And current uh, TCS from IMO just doesn't work, as far as I can see from from all the data. So so we are not there yet, but hopefully this will be what what will solve our problem. Sanjay, can I ask you? I mean, we haven't had really time to discuss carbon credits and sequestration. And we all know that there are some projects which are better than others when it comes to sequestration. Um, unfortunately, that's going to have to be something that ship owners and, and charters are going to have to be knowledgeable about because we're in this transition stage. Hopefully, there will come a time when they'll be at zero emissions and they won't have to worry about that. But that time is not now because the technology is not there. So could you just talk me through some of your thinking about the challenges around accounting for greenhouse gas emissions generally, but specifically for the shipping industry? No, uh, happy to, Paul. But I, just before I jump into the answer to your question, I just wanted to chime in on the discussion about slow steaming and um, uh, uh, engine derating and this whole idea of uh, going slower, which makes sense to, to save uh, energy in this uh, tiered pricing system. What, what we must not lose sight of is the maritime sector is just one part of an entire product supply chain. You've got producers which have year-on-year -year ambition to up production rate by 5-10% all the time, right? So they're making more and more stuff 
every every year and they're not creating more storage space what they're hoping is i'm going to make the stuff and dump it onto the ship as my storage space because i want to get the sales transaction going then on the other end you've got the consumer who's demanding for more and more stuff right and the, the buffer system there is the ship and the warehousing system so you're going to have the, the the entire balance of how a ship operates has to change but it requires both the producers and the consumers to also get their act together so there's a lot of supply chain inefficiency that forces the ship who's caught in between to move faster or slower and that's why uh, uh, slow steaming and uh, uh, derating can be uh, can work both ways, right? So it's not so clear on that one. Well, just just on that, I mean, I, I do agree with you. Certain trades, like the soybean trade from Brazil to China, I mean, the ship ends up spending three months waiting to discharge because someone doesn't have a GMO certificate or because the price has gone up and uh, people can't pay for it and they use the ship as a floating warehouse. So all these efforts to to try and get in and out of ports as quickly as possible, maybe try to save a few, um, you know, emissions by by slow steaming or whatever, completely yeah, yeah. Uh, wrecked by, as you quite rightly say, um, the commercial pressures on the pricing, but also the warehouse and using ships in many many bulk trades as as basically floating warehouses. That's right. And 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 and, and to, to your question on on what carbon capture, there is uh, a lot of effort ongoing today to see how can we integrate capture systems, especially with the uh, advancement in the uh, these scrubbers for knocking out socks. People are thinking, can I knock out NOx? Can I knock out CO two? Um, and all, also coming up with different systems. Uh, a lot of it was developed on the land base, you know, but it's looking like amine-based systems to actually scrub out the CO2. Um, the plan, the plan that everyone has in mind, the general plan that I've seen over at least seven to eight solutions over the last six months has been to capture the CO2 and liquefy it uh, into tanks. So, and the, the and the CO2 has a triple point. So we've got to be careful between the pressures and temperatures so it doesn't solidify. Uh, but uh, but that is doable to put it on board, capture it on board ships, and then to offload it at ports, which could serve as hubs or aggregating hubs uh, for CO2. Then onload it again to proper CO2 carriers and people are, uh, have been looking at uh, the chemical tanker industry as a potential candidate for carrying the CO2 to be then sequestered into uh, old oil fields. The Northern Light project in the North Sea is in case an example where they're testing this out today. Uh, the challenge really is to make sure there's not much energy deficit. That means because you need energy in, in, in one way or another. So are you going to burn more fuel just so that you can capture the CO2? So striking that balance for one. Uh, there is a heat balance equation that needs to happen. And also the space balance, because you need to kind of calculate what's your maximum debit on space because space is required for cargo, but what's available based on the ship design, whether you can put it at the back so you don't have debit on cargo space, but you can't, you can't sail in perpetuity to capture the CO2. That means you've got to look at the voyages. Are you looking at the 28-day voyage or 10-day voyage? And if I do, is there a port that can take offload the CO2? And can the CO2 be then used again? So there's a bit of solutioning that has to happen. But pe people are beginning to think about this only because it does, as green fuels ramp up, we need an interim solution. Because it's otherwise... It's so interesting you say that because um, I... Um, I have been um, discussing with, with certain people um, uh, dual fuel where um, it's not something that you can put in retroactively. It has to be installed at the time of new build so that you need a, a chirogenetic tank and piping to hold um, LNG as a, as a fuel. And then what you do, and it, it, it would cost an extra, say, 10, 20 million on the, on the price of the vessel. It'd have to be a big, expensive vessel. Container ships would be ideal, the big container ships, because where they go, the main ports do tend to have LNG terminals. And, and what you do is when the, um, 
when the price of LNG is is uh, lower than than uh, low sulfur fuel oil, then um, you you take LNG. When the low sulfur fuel oil is is lower, you take that. Um, I, I can't really say too much more about it and why it's attractive, but um, I can see exactly that it's the same argument that people were having about scrubbers. You know, is it really worthwhile trying to retrofit them as opposed to try and be upfront about it and put it into a new building? And there is an extra cost there. Will you therefore get a better charter rate or put it another way? Are you more likely to reduce your fuel over the life of the ship? Um, uh, and, and so people, you were absolutely right, people are thinking all around those, those options. Um, again, Joe and I, I, I wonder, I mean, uh, as I say, I, I, I remain pragmatic in that I think that all of these things, um, the drafting of the clauses, the actual lim- liabilities, uh, indemnification, we've been through them all to a certain extent whether it's sanctioned clauses, whether it's cyber, where, you know, collateral damage on cyber, um, you know, insurance is there to actually protect people from their own negligence. I mean, there was a, there was a conversation about 80% of cyber attacks are caused by operators uh, on board ships and or uh, ports uh, negligently, but innocently um, allowing those cyber attacks or enabling those cyber attacks to happen by not following procedures. Uh, is that an exclusion to cover? Is it not? I mean, we've been down this road. I can't see that it's beyond us as an industry um, getting together to, to create vehicles, whether they be physical or documentary, uh, to reach the allocation of risk or the concerns about indemnities. I mean, electronic bills of lading, <laughs> we've been there before. New, new, new uh, developments can be um, adopted. We've just got to think through all the possible consequences. In terms of cyber security claims, um, cyber claims, as far as P&I insurance is concerned, if the claim is received by a third party as a result of a um, a cyber malfunction, um, and just by way of example, the actual emissions are larger than actually declared to the relevant authorities and vessel is fined or some form of financial penalty is imposed, in principle, that would be covered by a p and insurance. However, it would have to be a malfunction or a failure of the system on board the vessel. If it's a failure of the servers ashore, that would not necessarily fall within um, P and I cover, and, and an owner would have to look to any other insurance which he, he may have in place. So a lot will depend on where that system failure occurs, on board the vessel or ashore, in terms of P and I cover at least. Um, and, and if, for example, there was a cyber attack um, and there was a ransomware demand, just just for the sake of argument, then the payment of any ransom would not be covered. Um, an owner would have to look at um, cyber policies in the market. Um, he may have them. As, as the world become ever, ever more digitalized, it may be that owners are actually taking out those policies. But, but in the ransomware scenario, they would have to look to those policies. If you're talking about just a failure of the, the system, just a malfunction, FD&D cover may kick in um, for a claim against that software provider. Um, depending upon the underlying cause, so there is potentially uh, insurance there. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but it's product liability insurance, and the issue yeah. therefore would be whether there was a mismanagement on board the ship, uh, which which broke the chain of causation. Um, as I say, I think I think it's possible for a good minds to address all these things. Um, does anybody have anything else they'd like to contribute on that, Poonit, Sanjay? Um, on on the particular t- topic of liability, yeah, I yeah, know I, I wanted I, I had not answered the question on carbon accounting. Yes, uh, and I, I think uh, uh, most of you would know that IMO had already completed the fourth GHG study uh, about 18 to 24 months ago, and uh, the the working groups under the MEPC is currently trying to decide on which formula to actually adopt. Uh, from a life cycle analysis perspective. So there's a, there's a lot of debate going on. Part of the debate is correction factors. 
that would be applied to get a, a, a greater accuracy of the CO2 footprint. And like Andre said, has shown that there is a discrepancy between what, what you calculate with the formula and what really happens on the ship. And that's why there's this whole uh, body of discussions around correction factors for the different fuel, fuel types. But it is going to be a very important element as we transition uh, and the, the quality of digitalization uh, uh, in terms of pulling out data that will give you accurate representation of your carbon footprint is going to be far more critical going forward in the next 25 years. And I think, uh, uh, as I said, because of compliance, there is going to be a bit of disputes, especially if there's taxation or there's incentives. So if other people are collecting less incentives or being overtaxed, and you're going to have disputes on that part as well. So uh, we need to get this part right. We need to have an agreement on how we calculate the carbon footprint and, uh, uh, and then use that as the baseline and then work from there going forward, at least in this next 25 years of transition. Thank you very much for that. Well, um, dear audience, we've come to that point in time. Um, probably 10 minutes later than we should due to me. And again, great apologies for my rushed entrance. I can tell you it's one's worst nightmare. It's like, um, it's like failing to turn up for an exam because you overslept. I, I never did that, but I dream about that constantly. Um, and I'm sure a number of people do. To five minutes before uh, a seminar like this, to lose your PowerPoints, to lose your notes, and not to be able to get into your computer uh, was a living hell. So I do apologize very much, but I can assure you it was a most unpleasant experience for me. Um, that said, there is time now for questions. And I wondered uh, if anybody did have um, some questions. I'm looking at the chat box. Um, Winnie, I don't know. I can't see any questions here. Winnie, do you? Um, there are questions in the Q&A box. Oh, I'm looking at oh, the Q&A, forgive me. Yeah. Um, yes, I think this is one uh, for Sanja, actually. Uh, this is from uh, Robert Abador. Um, he understands that CIA takes into account the trading of a vessel, uh, not only the efficiency of the vessel. This is important as waiting times for birth delays will adversely affect the vessel's rating. CII is not just looking at efficiency, but it looks at usage. This is not how efficiency is measured in many other areas. I mean, that's an excellent point. Uh, Sanjay, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give a go. First thing, if you look at what CII stands for, it's a carbon intensity index. It, it doesn't refer to energy efficiency per se. The energy efficiency does lower the carbon intensity index, but Unless you're, if you're not sailing at all, then I'm sure your CII will be close to zero, right? Uh, yeah, maybe in uh, running your auxiliaries to keep it going. So it is, the index does, uh, does a focus on actual usage and actual uh, carbon uh, emissions, but the intensity is a function of the distance you travel this usage. Uh, so yes, it is not the traditional energy efficiency calculation. It is really about carbon intensity per kilometer travel. Okay, thank you. I, I may add here, uh, in fact, it is, it is efficiency index. The EEDI measures uh, uh, the amount of carbon per ton of your dead weight per nautical mile. And CII also measures this exactly the same way. So carbon uh, amount in tons per tons of your cargo per nautical mile. So it is efficiency. But CII, unlike the EDI, takes into account the actual fuel that you used to calculate the actual CO2, not some fictitious shop test. So it uses your fuel that you have on board and it uses your real, uh, your real nautical miles. So you can get it from your AIS. Um, unfortunately, there is an allowance that you use dead weight rather than cargo. So if you use less cargo than your dead weight is, then of course you can sort of massage your, your CII. But let's say, let's say it is honest uh, 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 calculation. It is in the end efficiency 
uh, indicator, not not real uh, uh, CO2 uh, kind of uh, uh, in, in quantities that the ship uh, produces. But you can calculate because you have the record of nautical miles, uh, because you have your record of um, well, in fact, you directly have the record of your fuel oil consumption. So you can calculate your emissions for your ship for a year within the, the database of your IMO this yes. Yeah, uh, Andres, but, I think you, you, you're right. And I, I think what I was trying to distinguish was the efficiency of an engine in terms of its output. But I think this one, the, the, the basis per kilometer traveled is the efficiency denominator uh, versus uh, uh, fuel input versus uh, uh, power output. I, I just wanted to add one commercial angle to this. The EEDI, the EEXI is a once in a lifetime assessment, right? And that's gonna be done in 2023 in EEDI, obviously when the vessel was built. But the CII is an ongoing assessment. It's gonna happen year after year. And there are these reduction benchmarks which need to be met by 2% reduction every year. So this is a sword that is coming back and hanging on the head of the owner every year. So this is going to be an interesting discussion. Whatever lessons have we learned from 2023 CII exercise, can we actually use them to use the, C, uh, the CII and the 2024, improve it, improve it, improve it. That is where I think commercially it's going to be one of the most interesting game changers in, in, in the industry uh, for a long time. Yeah, That's a very valuable uh, contribution. Thank you. Thank you, Poonit. Um, we now have some interesting questions from Chair saying Chong, Mr. Chong, who um, I, I don't know whether it's tongue in cheek, I suspect it is, uh, but I'm very grateful for anybody who wants to stimulate debate. His first question, and I'll decide who I ask to answer <laughs> when I've absorbed it, is it, in which case there are so many restrictions, why don't we charter from shippers who are easy to deal with and offer good prices? Now, I don't know whether he's an owner having a dig at charterers, or, or, or whether he's he's um, a trader, but but uh, anyway, um, does anyone uh, like Pin? It you seem to be engaged. Would you like to? <laughs> I, I would just tell him to come and talk to me uh, and and Wiz in general because we generally, at least the way I'm looking at envisaging a solution is, digitalization should shift cost to a lower arena. That's the whole point of digital transformation that you're reducing your transaction costs to the lowest possible. Uh, number, which is why digitalization re reaps rewards eventually. So yes, it would be possible to reduce your cost, but whether you can actually speed up to 33 knots, as he says in the next uh, uh, comment, uh, I'm very much doubtful of that happening. But uh, yes, the idea is that digital transformation, digitalization should drive a reduction in cost. Whether it is easy to comply is purely going to depend on the ability to measure and, and improve, as I said, on current uh, measurement criteria, which are definitely complicated to say the least. Yeah, So more technology should be useful, but whether it is actually effective, we have to wait and watch. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are shippers who are, um, who are charterers as well, but um, um, hey ho, thanks for asking that. Yes. Well, I ought to read out his next question for which I'm very grateful, Mr. John, um, as he says, and I think it's an aspirational um aspirational comment. Um, all of us want it very cheap rates and at maximum speeds, 33 knots is ideal. <laughs> yes. I mean, if I may answer Mr. Chong, uh, both questions. The point is that um, whether he likes it or not, uh, this is coming and it will have to be complied with. Whoever the owner is, uh, it will have to comply with the same regulation. So unless he means easy to deal means that you somehow evade it. There is no option here. <laughs> they all will have to meet the same regulation if they trade internationally. And as I said, there's also that reputational issue depending on the size uh, and um, company. I wanted just to, to perhaps end, I mean, we're not at the end, but I, just on making a couple of comments. During my reading up on this, um, I, I uh, started looking at, uh, oh, there's, hang on, there's more coming in. Uh, okay. Um, that there is such a thing now as a climate litigation. 
It wouldn't surprise you to know that 75% of this is happening in the United States. Um, but climate litigation is a real thing. Recently, the Friends of the Earth took an action against, I think, a major oil company, I think it was Shell, in, if it wasn't, uh, forgive me, in, in relation to a Mozambique LNG project. Well, people in the shipping industry might think, what's that got to do with us? It's got a lot to do with us because on any, um, on any LNG project, there are invariably greenfield, there are invariably dedicated LNG ships which are built and they are very expensive. Four of these things can cost a billion. So we're seeing projects there um, being already um, affected by, by climate litigation. Um, climate litigation uh, can take all forms. It, it can be in tort, it can be in nuisance, it can be taken by individuals, by classes of individuals, by resort owners, um, fishermen, in, in the same way as we've seen with, with OPL, employees um, and such like. And that is something which is gaining massive momentum. So whilst um, I, I struggle to try and think of something in, in the shipping sector other than the tort of nuisance, whereby something about shipping and compliance with uh, the demands of a project mean, mean that a, a class of individuals are, are damaged in some way physically or economically. Um, but it is something that uh, I think there's been something like um, 78 countries already got some form of climate litigation there. That's something to watch, I think, on, on legal challenges um, as we have to be more compliant. Now, the other um, rather interesting uh, thing that I read was that between 1854 and 2010, and I don't know how, I suspect that this is a very broad, um, very broad brush figure. Um, almost two thirds of carbon emissions were attributable to 90 um, public and state owned companies. And they are called the major carbon or the carbon majors, I should say. I mean, that's quite staggering, but maybe it's not so staggering when you look at that first slide that I showed you, which showed you which industries have contributed mostly uh, to current day carbon emissions. Um, so, you know, that, that, that got me thinking about, it should be easy to get these people on board um, and, and try and reduce it. And, and they are on board. Um, because of these regulations and because of genuine desires. I don't know, has anybody come across these, these issues, which I think are certainly the climate litigation is something that's going to affect us all? Does anyone have a comment on that? Andrea? Party con context, it's more of an indirect effect. If it causes delays to a vessel in port, um, there's likely to be disputes as to whether time counting and perhaps more importantly in a, in a voyage charter context, the knock-on effect on its lay time. So I think at the moment there's probably more indirect effect on, on shipping, um, but, but certainly you can see those disputes where, you know, cargo can't get into port um, or can't be loaded because of climate protests. Okay, that's... that's certainly helpful. Um, I also, just to, um, there's a very good report by the Journal of International Maritime Safety, Environmental Affairs and Shipping. And uh, in this very lengthy report, just on the question of digitalization, it's a good report because it links digitalization with decarbonization. And I just wanted to, to quote uh, the first opening paragraph in order to address high operating costs, safety, security, health of crew, nearly two thirds of the shipping industry has gradually begun to use digital technology in their business. I won't quote the source. For activities other than efficiency enhancements supported by data gathered from numerous sensors and sources, such a use is successfully assisting the industry to monitor control and make decisions. This has encouraged the industry to look at using digital innovations for a number of activities such as supply chain management, emission data, recording management, decarbonization, and others for economic gains. However, currently the use of this technology 
for decarbonization is challenged by the lack of accurate, objective and accessible data. With the acceleration of digitization, digitization, not digitalization, <laughs> digitization and increased use of digital platforms as a result of the pandemic, COVID-19, it is envisaged that the requisite tools and solutions for reporting emissions are emerging and will help to address lack of affordable data. And that's, um, that's a report by KPMG in 2020. Furthermore, activities such as supply chain to impact carbon emissions and are required to be controlled for the decarbonization of the shipping industry. It is essential to discuss nearly all such activities and more for an improved understanding as to how digitalization can be used and encouraged for successful decarbonization of the shipping industry. May I just say that um, with great thanks to uh, my incredible panelists, I think we have managed to touch on almost all of those issues, whether to the satisfaction of, of, of the audience here, I'm not sure, but it is, uh, it's a very wide ranging and broad area. And I thought that was quite a good way perhaps to conclude, unless anybody here has any final comments they might like to make. I would just like to say that uh, I'm going to start on this journey next week with a new company. I would love to kind of come back and, 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 and see somebody talk about what has been the real practical experience over the year. I would have some myself, but I'm sure others would be interested. So maybe Singapore Maritime Week 2023 would be a fantastic year for us to actually compare these notes and maybe have a more holistic discussion. Uh, involving owners, charters, IMO, regulators, putting together uh, their hats and experiences to hopefully give me and other players some insights, uh, which will hopefully help us in our day-to-day -day work as we go along. Yeah, Thanks. Thank you very much, Bernard. Uh, I Thank you all for attending. Uh, thank you, my panelists, for your great contribution, Andrea, um, Sanjay, Andre, and Bernard. Thank you very much. And, thank uh, you very much. <laughs> And thank you very much for the Singapore Chamber of Maritime Arbitration for hosting this event and, and for um, really being engaged in, in this shipping week on it. And, and of course, the, uh, the partners to the SCMA, who are the Singapore Maritime Foundation. I think I mentioned that um, Tang uh, Beng Ti was, was involved in discussions with Punit about putting this together. So many thanks to her and all the other people who are behind the scenes at the SCMA. Thank you all very much. And of course, the, the MPA who is also involved. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Bye. Thanks a lot. Have a good one. Enjoy the rest Thank of you. Singapore Maritime Week. Thank you.